I can focus on all kinds of reasons why this is really terrible, but then I can also say, well, wait a second now. I am separated from my family, which means I have a lot of extra spare time right now and I, can't, I can complain about that if I like or I can use it. Oh, I'm separated from my company. Well, you know what? Most of them are working remotely right now anyway and they're looking for things to do. Oh, and I have my studio here. Oh, and I have broadband. I have really high speed internet. So all of a sudden I was like, how can I give back? What can I do? And so what did I start doing? I started like you have a YouTube show. I, I, my, my, my clients have been asking me for years to launch a YouTube show or a podcast or something. I just travel too much, can't do it. All of a sudden, I'm not traveling so much, I can do it. And so I think that if we focus on who we wanna become and how we can create value for the people around us, then we're, we're preparing ourselves for the world that's coming next. There's a world that's coming next that I think is gonna divide the world up into takers and givers. And the, the, the takers are gonna have a very difficult time in the new economy. And the givers are not. Because you see, I believe that we're willing to do more for others than we are for ourselves. So the funny thing is, when we start getting into this generosity uh, uh, economy, then what happens is you go, well, well, wow, if I want to do this for somebody, then I've got to take care of me. Like, I, I've got to take care of my health. I've got to take care of my family and so on. And I think that the more we take a look at that, how, what, is, what do I need to do? Who do I want to become? And, and, and what do I need to do to make sure that I'm in the best possible condition to support other people? Then. I think the new world's be a whole lot easier for people. Hi, I'm Bablina Papaluka, and I have with me today Eric Edmitz, who is an internationally recognized business speaker, a serial entrepreneur, and the founder of Wild Fit, a company that deals with transforming your health through nutrition. Eric is joining us today from the Dominican Republic, where he lives, to talk about business, marketing, maintaining optimal nutrition and health during this coronavirus crisis and after. Um, wherever you are in the world, this is going to be highly valuable for you. Eric, hi, and thank you for being here. Thank you for joining. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. It's going to be very interesting. And before we start, I want to give you a bit of background about my special guest and why he's one of the top experts out there to advise us on these topics. So uh, he's going to talk about it himself as well. But I want to say that Eric has owned businesses in a, in a variety of industries, including mobile computing, uh, medical simulation, augmented reality, uh, 3D engineering, Hollywood special effects, where he had the privilege uh, of working on Hollywood blockbusters like The Avatar, The Pirates of the Caribbean, Transformers, and Iron Man. After spending the earlier part of his life struggling with illness, it's a common thing because I've had something as well that was healed naturally. So I will, I'm looking forward to hear your story about this. He became fascinated about uh, food's role in achieving true health. Uh, his research led him to live with the Bushmen in Africa, where he studied their eating patterns. And after dedicating many years in nutritional research, he created the popular Wild Feed program, uh, which um, his mission is to help people through, which, through this program to reset their relationship with food and achieve optimal health. Eric is also focused on business education. He travels the world many years now uh, to uh, host business and marketing education programs speaks at business conferences, providing executive coaching and business mentoring services. Eric's talks are designed to get entrepreneurs on the road to real business freedom, owning businesses that give both the financial freedom and the flexibility to spend more time on what really truly matters, which is family, health, and just living your life. And I love this because that's a big part of my work, uh, what my work has been focused on. So um, creating this lifestyle and financial freedom, and that will be my first question for you, Eric. Uh, Eric lives with his wife in the Dominican Republic, where they spend a great deal of time kite surfing, walking on the beach, and spending time with their daughter. And this is, for me, an ideal lifestyle. I've been watching you online because we are connected on Facebook. <laughs> so he does live this lifestyle. We've been connected for many years. So before we go into health and nutrition, which is going to be main topic today, because of especially this health crisis we are going through right now, let's start with this. 
with creating this lifestyle and financial freedom and the flexibility to work from anywhere, to spend more time on our health and what really matters for us, on, on our family, on our loved ones. Uh, I believe if you don't have this lifestyle um, and this financial freedom, you cannot really obtain the optimal health. I don't know if you agree with me, but it's, it's a combination of things. It's not only what you eat. And people are realizing it now more than ever during this pandemic that we need this lifestyle shift. Um, looking at somebody like you who makes everything look so easy, this lifestyle and this financial freedom, you've been living it for years. Uh, it looks easy and natural. You also have the right life partner with you. This is very important who supports you in this journey and in this lifestyle and you do things together. What, what did it really take for you to create this? Because you're from Canada originally. Now you live somewhere warm by the beach. Um, you have the success and the, and the family and I believe what people envision to be an ideal lifestyle. So how, how, what did it take and how long did it take? And was it easy, was it hard to create this? Um, how did it, this happen? How did you make this decision? <laughs> Well, uh, that's quite an interesting question. It's very wide open. It wasn't a single decision. I mean, I might suggest that there was a single decision I made, you know, as a young man that I didn't want to live an average life. You know, I, 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 I was clear that I wanted to live an extraordinary life. I wanted to travel and I wanted to meet incredible people. And I knew that from a young age. Uh, I had read biographies of fascinating people like Michael Faraday and Winston Churchill and and I, and I remember reading some of those things and thinking, wow, th those people lived through some really interesting times. And, and now, like, life is so boring compared to then. Like, you know, I was reading this the other day. If you were born in 1900, by the time you're 17, 18 years old, it's World War I. By the time it's 1933, you're 33 years old and you've just been through the Great Depression. Ten years later, it's World War II. Then, you know, it, like it, the next thing you know, you're going through the Cuban Missile Crisis the, it, and then they're putting people on the moon when you're 70 years old. Like what an incredible life. You know, there was so much depth of opportunity to experience real, like real ups and downs. And all of a sudden we live in this world that's so unbelievably safe comparatively. And I just made a decision as a young man that I wanted to, um, I wanted to, I wanted to be an adventurer. I wanted to explore. And I think that 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 one thought as a young man is what sort of led me out into the different paths. It's why I was able to go off into entrepreneurship. It's why I was interested in traveling to so many different places because ultimately I was curious. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's all about making the decision and really knowing what you want. And then you will find the way if you really want to. You know, I think that um, there's a balance between making a decision and really knowing what you want and also letting go of that to some degree and not being so attached to the, to the destination, you know? So here's a good example. I, I've climbed Kilimanjaro a number of times in my life as part of leadership programs that I used to run. So I think I've done it seven times. Mm -hmm. And um, I can tell you that if you are completely focused on the summit, if you're completely focused on the decision, on the, on the destination, then you lose a week of your life because you're not really in it. You're just in it for the end result. Whereas Instead, if you go there thinking, I'm here to have a grand adventure, I am here to experience the density of it. I'm here to experience the texture of it. I'm here to notice the little mice with the street three stripes down their back or the chameleons in the forest or the colobus monkeys. I'm here to have in-depth conversations with people and really get to know them. I'm here to lift people up when they need to be lifted up and I'm here to be lifted up when I need it. Like if you go at it for the full richness of the experience, then everything changes. And by the way, we all know this in everything except in our lives. Like for example, we don't pick up a book and read the last page. We just, we just don't do that. It, the last page wouldn't be nearly so delicious if you didn't read the 300 pages that came before that. But in life, for some reason, it's like we just want to jump to the last page every time. And so I think it's not so much about like, I know where I want to go and I'm on my way to get there. It's more about, I know who I am and I know who I want to become in, the, in this lifetime. And, and there's some things that I want to do on the way to that that are going to help me become that person. So I guess that's probably the answer to people who might have been working on this lifestyle for a while because I have thousands of clients and they've been teaching this, but 
for everyone, the journey is different. And looking at somebody like you, somebody might feel less or might feel less successful because they haven't reached there yet. So what, what can you say to people who feel that maybe they're getting stuck, maybe they're getting plateaued, they're not reaching that, that financial freedom that they want um, after putting a lot of work what would you say to them and maybe how can they get unstuck? Is there something that would help get somebody unstuck or is it just enjoying, enjoy the journey, like do your best and then allow it to show you the way? I think maybe one way to look at it is this, is let's imagine that somebody is like, it's Monday and their life is a certain way. Mm -hmm. And all they can do is focus on what they want it to be like. I want that. I want it like that. That's the way I want it. I want it to be like that. I want that person to be that way. I want this job to be this way. I want this project to work out like that. Every time you say that or act that way, what you're really saying is, I don't want it to be like it is right now. And so you're rejecting the present moment. The, in, in a very real sense, the more want you put out into your future, the more rejection you're putting into your present. And so I think that what we have to do is allow desire for the future, but not be so attached to it. Like, yeah, I think it would be absolutely great. Here we are on lockdown. You know what? I'd love to go spend a month in Thailand. I'd love to do it. But I don't want to love the idea of that so much that I reject my current situation. What I want to do is try to find a way to fully appreciate my current situation as well. And if I can do that moment by moment all the way through, while having a clear idea of where I'd like to end up or where I think I'd like to end up, I think that two things will happen. One is I may or may not end up in Thailand. But the difference is, did I enjoy the moments that led up to the reality of whether I got to go or not? So if I didn't get to go, here's a crazy thing. The way a lot of people live today. Okay, they end up getting to go to Thailand. Great. So what they then do is go, well, that's why I sacrificed all this other time working so hard and not enjoying it because I got the reward. Okay, that's a very you know, tough way to live as far as I'm concerned, but it makes it even tougher if you don't end up getting to go to Thailand. In other words, if somebody climbs Kilimanjaro and their only purpose for climbing is to get to the summit and they get 500 meters from the summit and they get sick and they can't go, then they climb back down and they failed. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is if your goal was to have a grand adventure and to grow as a human being, then you get 500 feet from the summit and you just can't go any further and you go, wow, what am I supposed to be learning from this? This is a fabulous, this is incredible. Thank you universe for not giving me what I wanted because this is where I get to grow. This is where I get to evolve and become a different human being. Now you come down the mountain and the entire thing was a phenomenal success. You enjoyed it, you learned from it, you experienced the density of it and you weren't so attached to the outcome. I, it's so true because I know people are like during the lockdown, all, all they could post about is when are they going to get out and they're, when are they going to travel. And then when you, they do go to Thailand, when they do manage to travel, that's the only experience they live for. And what about the rest of their life? And that's sad. And that's so true. And thank you for sharing that. It's really powerful for everyone. Like for 90% of people, I believe, even people sharing positive posts on Facebook, even during the lockdown, quarantine, how you use your time constructively annoys most people because they're living in the future. <laughs> so I believe in this new environment though, many more people will realize uh, what you have been doing for years and I have been doing for years, working from home and running a business from home, it's okay, it's normal. You can have a remote team, you can live anywhere. So for somebody that wants to start a new business right now, and they want to do it in this new way, in the new market conditions, start an online business that they can run from anywhere, they can sell online, reach their clients uh, anywhere. Like for me, living on a small island where our market is limited, we have to be able to also sell in other countries if we want to grow at some stage. So um, I know you've been speaking and coaching people on this for many, many years. So what are some steps that people can take now to build something that will be great in the next one, two, three, five years in this new environment? Because there's a shift right now. I think there's a bunch of really important work that we can be doing. And um, one, of the, one, of the, um, one of the things that I'm always looking at is that it's like... Um, as I said earlier, who do I want to become? 
You know, who, who do I want to become? I'm not here to ask for life to be easier. I'm here for me to get stronger, right? So, so the lockdown has been a really great example about that because some people have used the lockdown like summer camp. They just sit at home. They just give their life to Netflix. They eat junk food. They're putting on the COVID-15, you know, the 15 pounds or whatever. You know, it, there are some people that are just coasting their way through it. And it's funny because if you talk to some of those people, what they'll tell you is if they knew it was going to be this long, they would have invested in themselves more. You know, they might have written a book or they might have done some home study or learned a musical instrument or a language or something. But then you say to them, yeah, but you don't know how much longer it's going to be. So why don't you start doing that stuff now? Well, I've already lost all this time. And I think that that's the way a lot of people live already. That's the way they live through the week. They go, they, they, they have all these grand ideas about what they're going to get done in the week. For me, like many people told me, let's wait and see. Let's wait and see another month or when my business will reopen or when we go back. Let, let me wait and see. And they just postpone. And yeah. So and I think that the, the, the truth is that what we're beginning to learn is that what we did in life is what we're also doing in the lockdown. So I've, I've not really been that kind of person. I, uh, when, when the lockdown started, my first question was, who do I want to become? So I started taking a look and saying, well, I want to be fit at the end of the lockdown, not fat. So what did I do? I started making sure that I was working out and eating well. I didn't, I didn't go the, the, you know, a lot of people are eating all the comfort foods. I said, nope, no one at that. Then I took a look and said, what else do I want to do? I thought, well, you know, I, I'm so fortunate. Like I, I, I listen, I get it. I'm really lucky. Like I'm lucky that I'm in a position where I'm not worried about how to pay my rent. I'm not worried about buying food. I'm, I'm really lucky if this lasted for a year, I'd still be here, still paying my rent. I'm, I'm lucky. I, I get that. So then I take a look and go, wait a second. The reason that I do this, the reason that I've worked so hard to sort of metaphorically put my own oxygen mask on is so that I can help others. That's why I do what I do. So I started taking a look and saying, well, wait a minute. I can, I can focus on what's bad about the situation. I'm separated from my family. My, my, I'm separated from my employees and my company. They're in another country. Uh, I'm completely in isolation alone in a third world country. So all of a sudden I was like, how can I give back? What can I do? And so what did I start doing? I started like you have a YouTube show. I, I, my, my, my clients have been asking me for years to launch a YouTube show or a podcast or something. I just travel too much. Can't do it. All of a sudden I'm not traveling so much. I can do it. And so I think that if we focus on who we want to become and how we can create value for the people around us, then we're, we're preparing ourselves for the world that's coming next. There's a world that's coming next that I think is going to divide the world up into takers and givers. And the, the, the takers are going to have a very difficult time in the new economy. And the givers are not. Because you see, I believe that we're willing to do more for others than we are for ourselves. So the funny thing is when we start getting into this generosity uh, uh, economy, then what happens is you go, well, well, wow, if I want to do this for somebody, then I've got to take care of me. Like I, I've got to take care of my health. I've got to take care of my family and so on. And I think that the more we take a look at that, how, what is, what do I need to do? Who do I want to become? And, and, and what do I need to do to make sure that I'm in the best possible condition to support other people? Then I think the new world's be a whole lot easier for people. I love that. I love that. And, and, and you're on lockdown alone your wife and uh, child are uh, you've been locked down in different countries right yep. Yep. so you could have a lot to complain about but you're not you're sitting there and you're giving and you're doing all these interviews and it's really it's all about mindset yes who do i want to become and then there is help everywhere online there's so many people to help you if you just make even for free now there's so many interviews summits i've seen you participating in some i'm organizing some so um the answers are everywhere. Um, I want to ask you what shifts do you see in business in the next uh, few months that, and maybe a couple of years that people, entrepreneurs need to notice so that they grab the opportunity. Well, I think there's some really exciting things going on at the moment. And I, I sometimes feel a bit bad thinking about that because I know so many people are suffering. And, but the fact is, is that people were suffering before the lockdown. So we can't stop ourselves from moving forward because people are having a hard time. In fact, the best way we can help the people that are having a hard time is by taking care of ourselves, growing our lives, growing our businesses and contributing. So what, what, what is going to happen over the next, like, I, I don't pretend to be any kind of a futurist. I, 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 every now and again, I think I have an insight and, and, you know, great. So what's my current thought? My, my current thought is there is definitely going to be changes to the way we do things. Um, I think that a lot of companies are learning that they can do a lot more of their training and education online now. 
And so I think we're going to see a shift where, yes, we will, after the lockdown ends, we will go back to having face-to-face -face meetings and, you know, we will go back to flying to some degree. But I, I, I think that um, platforms like Zoom and that kind of stuff are just going to become a regular part of business. I, I know that I've done some corporate engagements now during lockdown where the companies are like, we got more value out of this corporate engagement with you on Zoom than we have from half the speakers they, we had in person. No, they didn't know they could do it otherwise, right? Yeah. They, they would think that, oh, Eric needs to fly to our offices. And now they, they've been forced to see a different way and they see it's working. Yeah. And so I think that we're going to see a lot more of that. I also think that we're going to see that a lot more people are beginning to realize that knowledge they have in their heads is valuable to other people. You know, there, there are all these parents that were already homeschooling their kids and they already knew how to do it. And all of a sudden, all these other parents didn't know how to do it. So lots of them started great little businesses, coaching people on homeschooling or how to cook or, you know, how to, how to maintain your marriage under lockdown. So a lot of people have recognize that they have life experiences and they have knowledge that's helpful to other people. And so what have they done? Created YouTube channels, created digital programs and, and products that they can sell. I think that we're going to see a lot of that type of stuff. But then on a bigger level, um, it's not so much I think that the economy is going to end. It's, it's that the economy is just moving. Yeah. You know, and so some industries are exploding at the moment. Exactly. Zoom, as a good example, is exploding while airlines are imploding. Uh, um, food delivery companies exploding while, you know, retail food distribution imploding. So I think what we're going to see is that where, um, uh, where traditional recessions have kind of had this, like they fall off a cliff and then they slowly climb their way out. I think what we're going to see is the economy fell off a cliff and then it's going to spike up a little bit. It won't recover right away, but it will spike up a little bit and, and quite quickly. And then it will slowly climb its way out. And I will put to you that some of the greatest businesses of the next 50 years are going to get created right here, right now. Some of them have already been created. Some of them will be created over the next couple of weeks and months. Because one of the things that happens during these times is the, 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 the big investment firms and that are normally like scooping up every opportunity that they can and take advantage of every niche and offering all these new services, there, a lot of them are pulling back out of fear. A lot of them are pulling back. And so they're leaving opportunities out there for, for people to jump in and make them happen. You know, um, I, I, I think that right now, there, we are at the time of the greatest opportunity of our generation and of any generation that's alive right now. And some people will handle those opportunities very, very well. And other people will sit back and wait. And, and you know, it's, it, it, that'll have everything to do with how, how it works like out for them. In life, like everything in life, right? But the people who are who do jump in and who do grab opportunities, they will see the opportunity right now and they will go full in. So um, I hope people watching us realize that and they do go full in. Um, you know, Pavlina, I was reading this story the other day and it, it, it's just, this is, this is the way I think people should be thinking. There was a guy um, playing golf and he missed this putt. And he missed the putt and he was certain it wasn't his fault. Like he was like, the, the ball didn't move right. The ball didn't move correctly. And so he ended up cutting the ball open and he found that the rubber center was off center slightly. And um, he found it, you know, and, and he was like, well, the, the center should be dead center because otherwise, how could you ever play this game? Because depending on where the rubber center is, you would need to know where to hit the ball and you can't see it. So what the hell? And so he then developed a system for designing golf balls where the rubber center would always be in the dead center. And he started a company called Titleist. And that company, I think it's been sold a number of times, but I think the last time it was sold, it was in the billions. And this was just a guy on a golf course who missed a putt, saw there was a problem and decided to solve it. And there are millions of stories like that. And I think that now with lockdown and the new world economy and the new world order and, you know, the new normal and all this kind of stuff, there's going to be tons of opportunities for people to go, oh, there's a problem. This doesn't work the way I think it should, or this is painful, or this is uncomfortable, or this could be more comfortable, or this could be easier. And, and I think that's going to give birth to just some absolutely incredible uh, companies, projects, and ideas. Yeah, looking forward to the next couple of years when these uh, startups and these businesses will <laughs> will start showing up. Uh, the lockdown businesses, uh, <laughs> the COVID-19 businesses. And last question about business because, before I go into nutrition because you are an expert in marketing. And, and the biggest question people have under normal market conditions is 
How do I sell more? How do I get more clients? And now the question is, how do I get more clients on a low budget or a zero budget? Because uh, we have to be careful. Everything is uncertain. And how do we market online? People get offended so easily with everything right now. So what would be your formula, your suggestion uh, with regards to marketing in this new environment right now? You know, I think it's all about adding value. It, ultimately, it's all about adding value and, and not worrying about people being offended. I mean, I'm not suggesting somebody should go out and be intentionally offensive. But the way I look at it is, I, you know, I, I, I use my Instagram account to share my views with the world. And, you know, if I post something that you don't like and you decide not to follow me, I don't want you as a follower because, you know, I don't want somebody so deeply entrenched in their position that they're not willing to have a debate, that they're not willing to have a conversation. I follow people that I don't agree with. And sometimes I'll tell them that. I go, I'll write back and go, I don't agree with you about that. That's how we get better. That's how we learn. That's how we expand as people. So I'm not so worried. You know, I, I, I'll tell you that uh, about nine weeks ago, I uploaded a video. No, first I did a post on Instagram saying that, yes, you should do your social distancing and wash your hands and don't touch your face and all the stuff the CDC and the WHO and the government were telling us. So I said, but here's the thing that's shocking me. Why are they not telling you to eat better? Why are they not telling you to get your health in line because your health is going to be, and you know what's really crazy? I lost a bunch of followers that day. Oh my God. I did. I lost because people were offended by what I wrote. They were offended by it. And, and I was attacked by a bunch of doctors that said, that's not how immunity works. You know, it doesn't work that way. What you eat isn't really important. It's do you have to have the antibodies and all these people attacking me. Well, then I released a video about what I called your last line of defense. And I might've been one of the first people on earth to say, if you want to defend yourself against COVID-19, you need to be healthy. Well, you know, that video has gone on. Millions of people have seen it. Again, people attack me. But you know what's crazy now? I get like 100 followers a day now all of a sudden. It just like changed all of a sudden. And so if I lost those 50 for speaking the truth, then those 50 were meant to go. Good riddance, goodbye. Or they weren't just ready in that moment and maybe they'll come back. But what I'm trying to say is that if you are speaking your truth and you are adding value, then today getting customers is easier than it's ever been. Because you see, 30 years ago, if you wanted to get customers, you had to go pay for advertising. You had to go knock on doors. You had to buy retail space. You had to go on the radio. Like you, you, you had to go walk up to people at a networking event. And you know, today, today you've got tons of platforms for shortcutting that process. I mean, honestly, if somebody can develop even the most basic speaking skills, just the ability to speak in front of a camera or a small audience, they can completely change the world. If I look, for example, at WildFit, I started WildFit as a hobby in my living room with eight clients. Today, we have over 25,000 clients. Well, we have way more than that, but in terms of the core 90-day program, 25,000 people have done that program in 130 countries around the world. Why? Because it's easier to market today than it's ever been. Here's an example. You really want to know the secret. You said I was a marketing expert. I don't think so. I'm a results expert. So what does that mean? I create programs that actually work. So what happens is, People do the program, it actually works. And then what do they do? They go on social media and they tell people that it actually worked. In the old days, they might go tell two, three friends. Now they post on Facebook and tell 300 friends. So marketing has become easier than ever before as long as you're good at creating results for people, in my opinion. And also speaking out uh, on the, like, like you said, like putting yourself out there and adding value. And you said that before, you said in the new economy, of the givers versus the takers. I love that. Uh, because everything is so, it's exposed now online and uh, those takers who are there just to take, they're being exposed slowly. Yeah. And uh, people can start seeing who the real givers are. And if you show up and you're the giver, you're gonna attract the audience and the clients and then you need to bag it up with a really good product. Um, I love that. We, we, we have, we use master classes quite a lot. So like 90 minute classes that people can come to and many of them are totally free. Mm -hmm. Now, many people have caught on to this idea of also using these free master classes, but for many people, the master classes are rubbish. They're just sales pitches. The entire yeah. thing is just selling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Those are the takers. Mm -hmm. What we've done is anybody who's ever done one of our master classes, of course there's marketing involved, but because I believe that results is the best marketing, every single master class that we do is unbelievably high value. People often, we actually ask them sometimes after the master class, what would this class have been worth if we were selling it? And it's usually like in the, hundred, in the high hundreds or thousands for a 90 minute master class. 
So, don't so be here's afraid. what's interesting. Don't be afraid to give some high value for free. Uh, yeah. for, now, yeah? the, the takers are causing some problems, right? Because now just, I don't know, about a week ago, we had a masterclass online about how to create a signature presentation if you were doing a TED talk or speaking on a camera or something. And immediately this guy writes in the comments, I'm sick and tired of all these free things, right? Why? Yeah. Because he's been to some classes that were run by takers. But here's the good news. What did a bunch of my clients do? They jumped on there and said, this is different. Every single masterclass is valuable, right? So I think if you stay true and you make sure that your, your objective is not marketing, but your objective is actually results, then the marketing will largely take care of itself. People will be able to see. I believe people are starting to see and uh, to distinguish between the two. Yeah, yeah. I, really, I really hope that to, to really happen on a, on a large scale now, people will be able to tell the difference uh, between the givers and the takers in this new economy. Um, great, I love that. Um, I wanna ask you about uh, your journey into uh, health and wellness and studying all that. Can you tell us a little bit your background and how you got into creating wild feed and studying nutrition, creating a program on how to shift how we eat, because your story is so fascinating. Wow, it's quite a long story, so I'll do the short version. But you know, like, like many people, what happened in my case is that I had a problem, and that was that I was sick. You know, I was, I was really not healthy, and I was suffering, and I was in pain, and, and most of the things I was dealing with were considered chronic. That is, that they're never going to go away. And of course, I'd been to see many doctors and specialists to try to you know, deal with the symptoms and make them less painful and all that kind of stuff. But you know, it just didn't work. Sometimes you'd push the symptom down for a little while, but it would always just come back. And, and then one day I was having a conversation with some friends about a surgery that I was supposed to be having. And they're like, whoa, 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 don't have the surgery. Can you just try an experiment for a month? And I'm like, what's the experiment? They're like, well, you know, eat less of this and eat more of that. And, you know, we'll just do an experiment for a month. And, um, you know, 30 days later, I had lost 35 pounds and all of my symptoms were gone and I was healthy. And I was really blown away by that. I was really blown away. Like, how is it possible that I could visit doctors for, you know, almost a decade and get no results, but I could just yes. experiment with my food? Sorry to interrupt you, but this happened to me as a child, two years in the hospitals um, with a lung infection. I would uh, miss out on school and then the doctors wanted to send me for an operation where they would cut part of my lungs. And then my mother found out about this naturopath. He was famous here in Cyprus. He took me there through the medicine. After one month, I was healed, a couple of months, only with nutrition. And my mom said, how is that possible? And she became a healer and studied nutrition. So, so I totally understand your story so deeply. So. Yes. So go on. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, like, so I just got really curious about nutrition and, and medicine. And, and, you know, I like one of the things that shocked me was I found out that um, a doctor can, can invest hundreds of thousands of dollars in 10 years of their life becoming a doctor and never, ever be required to study food. Yeah. And that really disturbed me. I mean, it really disturbed me. And so I, I went in and I, I, I became just obsessed. I read everything I could find. I, I, I just, I became absolutely obsessed with food and nutrition and health. And then I, and then I became frustrated. I became frustrated by the fact that you can tell somebody what to do. Like you can, you can give them the recipe. They can be, say, for example, they can be wanting to lose some weight. You can show them exactly how to do it. Or let's say they're type two diabetic. You can show them exactly how to reverse it. You can, this is the plan. But the fact is most people wouldn't follow the plan. They, 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 you know, it was just difficult. Like there was this um, resistance, uh, willpower wasn't working. And so about six, seven years ago, I started um, evaluating the tools that I used in business coaching to really change people and help them get results. And I thought, how can I apply that in, in the food space? And so about eight, about, sorry, about six years ago, I took eight people and I put them on a trial class just to see how things would work. And I, I had designed a program that, that paid attention to language patterns and story use and, um, and what we now call behavioral change dynamics, a very specific formula for creating engaging content that actually integrates information and transforms human experience. And all eight of them got great results. And that was statistically not likely. So I did another class of eight. And again, all eight of them got results, like it was really working. And then what started happening is they all started telling their friends about it. And then, then it was like, we're getting, you know, we're like, we have a hundred clients a year with no marketing. Like we, we don't even have a website. 
the only way you could buy it is if you saw me at a live event somewhere, you could come and buy it on an order form. That was it. And then one day, one of our clients did the program and then he asked me why we didn't have a website. And I said, well, because it's just a hobby, I, you know. And he goes, well, I think you should put up a website. And then he told his network about it. And the year before we had like 100 clients and all of a sudden 200 clients signed up in one week. And that's when we began to realize, holy, we're on to something here. And, and it just grew exponentially from there. And the crazy thing is, it grew exponentially without us spending any effort on marketing at basically at all. And, and then eventually we ended up with Mind Valley as a publisher. And of course, they do a great deal of marketing now. But even getting as far as getting to Mind Valley was a matter of results. You know, the Vishen Lakiani, founder of Mind Valley, kept hearing from friends of his about how their life was transformed by this program. So then he did it. And then it transformed his life. So then he told his network about it. So even though they now do some marketing, the truth is the real reason that it works, the real reason that it spreads around the world is results. Yeah. And, um, and, and it's probably the thing, you know, except for maybe my children, it's the thing that I'm absolutely the most proud of in my life because every single day I get letters from people saying, I'm no longer in pain. My inflammation is gone. My type two diabetes is over. I'm in remission. Like uh, every single day I get those messages and I can't think what greater gift you can give somebody than their health. That's amazing. Yes. And I've heard a lot about this program. It's very popular. And I want to hear your views on Yes, on coronavirus and any other viruses. How do we strengthen the immune system after all these studies you've done with the nutrition? What are the main components right now? Can we protect ourselves in a natural way, which I totally believe, but I want to hear your views. Uh, and what can we do to protect ourselves? And even heal faster if we, if we do catch it. Well, I think, uh, you know, I think the first thing people have to understand is that there's a fundamental difference between immunity and your immune system. You know, your, your immune system is your body's defense system and it's defending you while it tries to build immunity. Immunity means this virus can't hurt you anymore. So that, that there's a very big difference there. So there's nothing anybody can do right now to create immunity. That, that's not possible. The only way to create immunity, you know, assuming you accept viral theory and all that kind of stuff, the only way to create immunity is to be introduced to the virus, have your body learn from that process and learn how to create antibodies and now you have immunity. But the question is, how well does your body handle that process? And that has everything to do with your immune system. And, and what I would say is that, yeah, at the beginning of this you know, breakdown, I, I was saying, yeah, you got to go get your vitamin C, zinc, magnesium, and there's some others that you might want to consider. But now I would go one step further to say, yeah, it'd be good to do those things. But the main thing you want to do is not be overweight, not be diabetic, not be hypertensive, because the statistics are absolutely clear that if you have one of these lifestyle diseases, then you are far more susceptible, you're far more likely to become ill or, and, and far more likely to die than you are if you don't. If, you know, I was reading some statistics about this last, uh, for, for a webinar we were doing, and it's like, first of all, here, here's a fascinating thing. 48.5% of the people that die from COVID-19 48.5% of them have three other major diseases like obesity, diabetes, hypertension, autoimmune disease. Like they have 50% of the people that are dying have three other diseases. In other words, they were dying already. And then 25.6% of people have two other major diseases and 25.1% of people have one other major disease and less than 1% of the people that die from COVID-19 didn't have any diseases. So in the end, what I would say is that the very best thing you can do to protect yourself from COVID-19 is to be healthy. That, that is the very best thing that we can do. And, and by the way, here's another thing. If somebody has cardiovascular disease, which is a lifestyle disease, and I'll talk about that in a minute because I don't like that expression lifestyle disease at all, we'll talk about that. But if you have um, a, a cardiovascular disease, then your, your mortality rate from, this, from COVID-19 is 14%. So it's pretty high. If you, on the other hand, have diabetes, your mortality rate is about 9%. If you have a, a, a chronic respiratory disease, it's about 7%. If you have hypertension, it's 7%. If you have cancer, it's 7%. But you know what? If you don't have any of those diseases, it's 0.3%. So the very best thing you can do to protect yourself from COVID-19 is go back in time 10 years and stop eating the way you were eating. Now, of course, it seems too late, but here's the crazy thing. You can turn these things around in weeks. Somebody can turn their diabetes around in something like six weeks. 
In six weeks, you can get yourself to a place where you no longer have the blood sugar conditions that are, that are, that are comparable to diabetes. Now, I'm not saying it means that your journey with diabetes is over at six weeks. What I'm saying is, is that you can be a whole lot healthier and no longer medicine dependent. So I think the very first thing any one of us should be doing to protect ourselves from COVID-19, forget about, I mean, look, do your social distancing, do all that stuff, depending on where you live, follow the guidelines. But more important, in my opinion, than any of that is eat well, breathe well, drink well, move well, take care of your body. Exactly. Yeah. I've been doing a lot of that during the lockdown, a lot, a lot more than normal. And I feel I haven't been so productive in my work, but I felt my body needed it and also sleep. And I saw your video and you say sleep is important. And I said, okay, I needed to do that to strengthen myself. And I'm going to continue doing that even more right now. And that's why I bring experts like you to talk to people, to help them to realize because I've been through that experience as a child, like you with a health issue that couldn't be resolved with any medication. And then suddenly I start eating properly and then detoxing and suddenly I'm well after two years yeah. in the hospitals. So people who didn't have that experience, they're in fear. Uh, but we should educate ourselves and, and know better. I don't like that expression when people say educate yourself today. It's, it's, it's starting a fight, but it's just, I think it's common sense uh, with all the data. And, and um, you talk a lot about cravings and I have a big sugar tooth and sugar grape cravings. And you talk about emotional eating and snacking and late night snacking. And people have been doing a lot of that, especially at this time at home. And I've been working for, from home for years and I tend to snack too much and eat too much and I know it. So how do we control that? And how do I control my late night snacking? How do I reprogram my body? Uh, I know you talk in depth in your program, but maybe some tips on what gets- Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to give you the tips on that. I mean, obviously anybody can go, we have a 14 day reset program where you can completely look at your relationship with food and, and, and change it. I think something like 85% of the people at the end of the two weeks say that their relationship with food is permanently altered. And then of course they can carry on and do the full three month experience with us. But I, I, can, I can tell you right now, like one of the things that we need to take a look at is recognizing the real reason that we're eating. So when you talk about emotional eating, for example, here's a great exercise you can do. Before you eat the food, you, you stop and you go, what am I feeling right now that's pushing me to eat that food? Like what is the emotion that I'm feeling right now? Okay, so I'm feeling say depressed. Okay, then what emotion do you want to feel? What, what, how, how would you like to feel instead? Because what you're going to go do is you're going to go try to eat that food and you think that food is going to make you feel a certain way. So how do you think it's going to make you feel? Is it going to make you feel happier? Is it going to make you, make you feel more connected, make you feel more satisfied? Great. Then, then the next question is, what is another way that I could feel that way? What's another way that I could create that feeling that isn't necessarily that food? And so a lot of times, for example, I've worked with clients that have a thing with chocolate where it's like, and by the way, I'm not against chocolate. I'm just against chocolate and using you. So, so now let's say you're having a moment where you're feeling a little alone or you're feeling a little low and you go, wow, chocolate would make me feel good. Well, here's what's really crazy. Notice this. Let me ask you something. If you're feeling a little down and you decide you're going to have a little bit of chocolate, when do you start feeling better? Um, only the first moments after the chocolate. Really? Think about it. I want, you, there's a big breakthrough to be had here. I want you to imagine what, what time of day do you usually, what time of day does chocolate usually speak to you? Me, uh, after lunch, sometimes okay. in the evening. Okay, so let's say it's after lunch, you're dipped down a little bit in energy, you're dipped down a little bit in energy, and then what happens? You think something. Yes, I want something sweet. Okay, and okay. then do you, argue, do you argue with yourself about it a little bit? Well, lately, you know, with all these vegan sweets and everything, I try to have something ready with avocado and cocoa, and, and then I, I just eat something healthy with chocolate. I don't okay. know if you think so it's healthy. I, I want you to imagine that you're sitting at your desk, and, yeah. you're, and you're feeling a little low, yeah. and then you think, oh, I could go have a treat. My yeah. question is, when do you start feeling your energy coming up? When do you start feeling better? <laughs> When I think about having the treat, that's right. I it's start not, getting excited. <laughs> it's not the treat that's making you feel better. It's the rebellion. It's the decision. It's the choice. 
So in other words, you're sitting there feeling level three, and then all of a sudden you go, oh, I'm gonna go have my chocolate mousse. And then you suddenly go to level six. Here's why that's dangerous. Now you're eating the food at level six. It wasn't the food that lifted you to level six, it was the idea of the food that lifted you to level six. But now you're at level six while you're eating the food. So your body goes, just like Pavlov's dogs, your body goes, oh, look, I'm at level six and I'm eating this food. And so it starts to link up level six to the food, but it wasn't about the food. Then the sugar hits your system and it does push you to level seven, eight. Plus on top of that, your idea of taste is kind of affected by the fact that you have all this serotonin and dopamine in you. You know, sometimes drugs can make food taste very nice. So can the internal drugs. So you've made yourself feel great with all this dopamine. Then you go eat this food. I mean, have you ever had this experience where you give yourself permission to eat some food and the first bite is quite yummy, but then after that, you're not even tasting it. Have you had that? Mm -hmm. Again, it's not the food that's making you feel better. It's the decision. And why? It's because when you were a little girl, somebody noticed you were down and said, oh, oh, Pavlina, here's a little bit of chocolate. And you immediately, before you put the chocolate in your mouth, you felt loved and cared for and your, and your energy went up. Then you ate the chocolate while you were feeling loved and cared for. It's what my mom did. She cooked my favorite pasta the first time I visited after lockdown on Sunday. And then I was feeling like I ate so much. <laughs> yeah. Because you feel the love of your mother <laughs> through the food. So, my stomach was. <laughs> so what if the next time you're sitting at home and you're feeling a little bit low and your mind goes, oh, we could go have some chocolate. What if in that moment you said, you know what, we could, but I'm going to first call mom and talk to her for a little while. And then you just pick up the phone and you call your mom and you just talk to her and you just get a feeling of connection. And then isn't it possible that you talk to your mom and your energy comes up and you feel connected and then you don't even feel like the chocolate anymore. Because yeah. the truth is anytime you're eating food to solve for an emotional problem, there is another way to solve for that emotional problem too that isn't gonna necessarily damage your body the way bad food might. So do something before you go make a decision, find something that makes you feel good. Yeah, what's another thing that could satisfy your emotional need? What's another way you could feel better that isn't necessarily food? And it doesn't mean you never have that food again. It just means that you don't make it the rule. You don't wanna be in a position where you're using food as a drug. And anytime you're eating food for an emotion, you're using it as a drug. Mm -hmm. I, I, I understand and I have to do that that he said now uh, I have to because even even during lockdown when I couldn't buy the couldn't go out when I had a craving to buy something from the bakery let's say I would make these healthy sweets but it's still sugar <laughs> still I use honey and I use sugar and I still have the craving there so that's so interesting. Okay, I will be, I will be uh, trying that and I will uh, get from your team a link about uh, the program and I'm gonna post we it. Have a, we, oh. have a, we have a huge worldwide, like big campaign coming up on June 8th and we have a 14 day challenge starting on June 8th and you can, you can join. It's like, I think okay. it's getwildfit.com slash reset. And okay. you can just go there, sign up and it'll, you'll, you'll do the two week program to change your psychology with food and you'll, you'll be amazed. I will, I will uh, join that. It's time. I've been following you for way too long. So it's time. Um, I have so many questions, but we're coming towards an hour. So I'm going to try to, to wrap, it uh, wrap it up. Maybe a last question about when, I, when we wake up. And sometimes I wake up and I'm a little bit, I'm not a morning person. I'm feeling a little bit sluggish. I try not to have coffee. I have a smoothie, but I, I feel I need to meditate. And I take it easy because of the way I work and live, but other people can't take it easy. Is there a way to wake up full of energy by shifting your nutrition and shifting what you do? Is it something that I do that might make me feel a little bit more slow in the morning and sluggish? You know, um, um, it, it's funny because people often want like this one thing that's going to fix everything. So yeah, if you want to, if you want to wake up with some energy in the morning, then, you know, go get yourself some bulletproof coffee and slug that back first thing in the morning. And you're going to have a bunch of energy, right? Like it's a, a one-time fix. And without, without coffee. I know, I know. I'm just saying, <laughs> yeah. but, but, but then the, the real answer is less convenient than that. And the real answer is things like this. Like um, what I do is I don't use an alarm to wake up with. I use an alarm to make me go to bed. So you set an alarm that says, oh, look, it's 9.30. I have to go, I'm going to bed now. 
and remind yourself, you know, one of the best ways to wake up fully charged in the morning is to make sure that you have a good night's sleep. So then how do you make sure you have a good night's sleep? Well, things like keep the room dark and cool and go to bed at a reasonable hour. Turn your electronic devices off two or three hours before you go to bed. Don't let that light into your face when you're about to go to bed. Uh, do a little bit of a gratitude appreciation before you go to sleep. What are you most excited about the next day? All of those things can help people no, sleep. Don't snack late. Don't, don't go eat uh, right before you sleep, right? Yeah. I don't know your views about that, but I do that a lot. Again. Well, it helps a lot not to. If you sleep on an empty stomach, you will sleep better. And mm -hmm. so, you know, one of the ways you can deal with that is you stop eating, say, three, four, five hours before you go to sleep, but then have a nice glass of water beforehand. Sure, maybe you wake up and pee in the middle of the night. Who cares? Go back to sleep. Reset. If you do the reset, I need to do the reset because the body is used to otherwise now. So I need to, to work on the reset. Um, yeah, and, and that's a big part of it is that, you know, the, the trouble for most people is, is that the food that they eat is robbing energy from them. It's giving them cheap energy and then costing them good energy. And mm -hmm. so when we can shift our relationship with food, we get to a place where we're putting the right things in and not too many of the wrong things. Then we wake up in the, like I wake, I, I never use an alarm to wake up in the morning. I wake up exactly when I'm meant to wake up and I wake up feeling good. And, and by the way, that even happens like um, uh, last weekend, I was stuck on a writing project and I just kept writing and writing and writing and writing. And the next thing you know, it was five o'clock in the morning. And I was just like, holy cow, what just happened? So I went to sleep, but I still woke up, like normally I might wake up at six. I still woke up at eight. I only got three hours in, but I had a great day anyway. And, and I went to bed at a good hour that night. You know, what I'm saying is, is that many people, if they lost one night of sleep, it would devastate them for a week. No, I was, it was fine because generally speaking, yeah. I'm eating really well, I'm exercising, and all of those things help you to sleep better and help you to bank more rest. Mm. Okay. Um, so last question I wanted to ask you, what, and you shared a lot, I guess, um, maybe you answered this question, but what realizations have we had personally during this crisis on a personal level that <laughs> might have helped you Know, creates certain shift in your life? You know, I think, um, yeah, there's been some big things for me. Like I, I really, um, normally I travel a lot. You know, I'm, I'm, I, this is the longest that I've been in one place for maybe 20 years. Mm. And um, it, it's unusual. The longest, the longest in 20 years. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I've, I, I, it, it's just not normal for me to, to not fly, you know, and I haven't been on a plane in, in maybe three months now or something. And, and, and I've begun to realize that I quite like that. I, I quite like that. I, I like being in one place. Now, I will not stop traveling. I will go back to it, but I will not go back to it the way I was before. I, I will change that. Also, um, you know, our company has largely been dependent on big live events, you know, big seminars and retreats and that kind of stuff. And you know what? We'll keep doing those. We'll, we'll start doing those again, but we'll do less of them because what we've identified is that we're able to do incredibly powerful programs online now for people. So now what I want to do is, is be able to reach more people flying less. And then when we do run live in-person events, it's, it's, um, it's for a group of people that have already been a long way with us beforehand, you know, that we've already cultivated that relationship. Amazing energy. Yeah. I've had this so, you know, there's definitely been some powerful personal shifts in my, in my personal thinking of my life and also in, the, in my professional life. And I, again, I, I, I'm aware that COVID has been incredibly painful for a lot of people. For me, it's been quite a gift. I, it's, really, it's, it's been a really important time of introspection and self-learning and, and business reevaluation. And uh, my life, I know already, is being improved by this. Mm. Great. Um, I, I felt the same and I don't, I feel okay sharing it. Some people get offended <laughs> if you felt, if the crisis was good for you and you feel a positive shift. Um, I guess, and I do, I have that thought as well about having less uh, live events, but then the audience is so much better and you have already built that relationship. And I hope we do collaborate on online events and maybe live events at some stage. I will be uh, in touch for that. Uh, where can people get more info about you, about the Wild Fit program? Can you give us a website or social media? Where, where is the best way to get in touch? Absolutely. Well, the best way to get in touch with me and keep track of me is uh, on Instagram. I manage my own Instagram account myself. I'm the one who replies. It's me. And that's at Eric Edmeads. And then, of course, I've got my website at www.eric.ee. 
And for WildFit, the best thing in the world right now is just to go to getwildfit.com slash reset and join us for this massive global two week challenge we're doing. And let's, let's like, let's make sure we come out of the lockdown in better shape than we were before we went in. Great. Uh, thank you so much for your time and uh, all the, the value you are giving through everything you do. And uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's stay in touch and, uh, and collaborate more uh, on That's events, great. online events and everything. I will post a link below for people who want to see if you're on the YouTube uh, channel, I will post a link below. Thank you so much, Eric. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs>